Good morning. Thanks for tuning in. We're excited to worship with you today and to bring a message from God into your life. Today, we just want to pray and then get started into worship so that we can have a great day in the presence of God. Heavenly Father, we ask that your presence would come into this place, into the studio and into people's homes where they're watching, into their cars, wherever they're watching from. And we pray that you would just be tangible to them today in the situation that we're in, Father. We pray for the United States. We pray for our leaders, our president, our Congress. Guide them, Father, in the way that they should go. Father, we pray that you would keep us safe, uh, continue to protect us from COVID-19, and Lord, heal those people who have COVID-19 or who, who know somebody who has COVID-19. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with them, and we pray that you would heal our nation and our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all From beginning to the end It'll always be, it's always been you, Jesus Jesus
church Jesus be the center of your church And every knee will bow And every tongue shall confess you Jesus Jesus Show us your love. 
Show us your glory In wonder and surrender we fall down Show us your glory Show us your glory Let every burning heart be holy ground Jesus at the center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. Today we pray that as Pastor June brings the word, that you would be with her, guide her, give her the words to speak. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello everyone. Good morning. Glad you're with us today. I am going to just go right into it. We'll be in John 6. The name of the message is Endure the Detour. So Endure the Detour. It's about misunderstandings. And I want to um, talk briefly about that and move on into the message that God has been sharing with me. So in John 6, starting around 50, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And he has a following, a quite large following, can I say. And the Jews are gathered. They're all there. Um, they're, they have been following him, observing him. And there's quite a number, and he decides to bring the level of teaching up a notch. And only few, it boiled down to 12, really understood the message. And others were offended, misunderstood him, and left. Okay? But that's Jesus' way sometimes of getting uh, the great, not the good. And he has a way of separating the wheat from the tares. Okay, so let's look at it together. It says, I am the living bread in uh, chapter 6, verse 50. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I give to the life of the world. Then the Jews begin to argue among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. In 56, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So this chapter is what thins them out, as I said. Okay? They get alarmed. They don't like it. I mean, he's not talking about chewing on his leg or his calf or his or his arm, right? It, he's not a cannibalist. That's not it at all. What he's trying to do is separate those who know him, okay? If you know him, you know exactly what he's talking about because you've walked with him. You know, you've, you've been around his teachings. You understand him. There's no misunderstanding because you know who he is and you trust in that. Okay, so look at chapter um, 6 again and 60. It says, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Okay, so here it comes. Don't miss it. It's good. Okay, 
From this time, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer followed him. I mean, talk about thinning out a crowd, all right? So in 67, you do not want me to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Okay, look what he's doing here. 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? All right? So he's testing the waters with the last 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, and I love it. Oh, I love it. Lord, to whom shall we go? <laughs> you have the words of eternal life. All right. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but that just gets me going. Amen. So he had 12 that were committed out of the whole group. Amen. And commitment is faithful. Commitment is faithfulness. All right. Or in other words, the, the definition of that is the state or the quality of being dedicated to someone or to a cause, to an activity. It's just being dedicated to that person. Okay. And in this case, Jesus. So here John is showing us the difference in people who are committed and those that are not committed. Okay. So we start to learn as we go through this chapter, what it means to be committed, how Jesus expects us to be committed, how to go from good to great, how to go from occasional blessings to tremendous blessing and being loyal and faithful. Right. And it's the difference of all of these fans around Jesus who watched him heal, who watched him, you know, do quite a few miracles in, with their own eyes to, you know, followers of Jesus where they took every step he did, okay? So I have never wanted to be a person who was an onlooker. You know, I like to get involved. And the, the, the fans of Jesus kind of hung out in the crowds and at a distance and kind of watched and had their own interpretation of things. Come on, somebody. So th then there was another level of people who walked with him and who understand stood him fully, and that was who he was calling out. So I hope to God that we don't ever be just an observer of God's will or doctrine, but we actually walk it out in our own lives. See, only commitment keeps you going with God, folks. Only commitment. We see that here in this chapter. The ones who trusted Jesus, believed in him, who knew him. You know, there was no misunderstanding, not with them. And they had an openly heavenly blessing because of it. The windows of heaven was opened over them because they knew him. Knew is an intimate term, No is. And it means a relationship, an intimate relationship with God when you know somebody. Okay, so you know that you hear it all the time. You never know anybody till you live with them. Okay, or walk with them or on a intimate type of level. Okay, you just know of somebody. So all these people that were there that day and heard his sermon only knew of him. But there was a few who knew him and knew that he wasn't a cannibalist that he wasn't saying, chew on my arm and you'll live forever. That wasn't what he was saying. They understood him completely. And even like Peter said, hey, I don't get your word here, man, but, you know, I get you. And you have always held the words of eternal life for me. You know, I've walked with you 10 years. I've walked with you 15 years. I've walked with you 20 years. And guess what? You've never let me down. So I know that you hold the words to life for me. So I'm not going to trust in what I hear. I'm not going to trust in, you know, what all these other others are mumbling about, as it said in the scripture. You know, they got all worked up about it. Grumbling is what it said. You know, I'm not going to listen to their grumbling because I know you, Jesus, and I know that in you is eternal life. Come on, somebody. We have to believe and know that you are of the Holy One of God. Come on. Do you know that Jesus is the Holy One of God? Amen. If you know him, you know that. See, when God calls us to do something, he expects commitment. He knew that the onlookers wouldn't have the commitment to, to, to take the walk. You know, a lot of people want to talk about a walk, but they don't have the walk. They talk about it. They don't walk it. 
And he knows that. He knew who was able to hold to the level of what he was expecting. Guys, do you know that we have a level of expectation too that Jesus has called for us? And he wants us to be committed. The principle applies the the principle of commitment applies to every area of our lives, whether it's a budget or whether it's a diet or whether it's a commitment in a marriage or a friendship or, you know, a work situation. All of it, guys, applies here. And the same principles is is pretty much the same because if you're not committed to it, it's not going to stay. It's not going to go the long haul. Amen. It's one thing to set a plan, but it's another thing to work the plan and finish it. See, the, the Bible says it's not how you start, it's how you finish. So, you know, God is saying to us that I've laid this plan out before you. I've, I've showed you what you need to do. I've called you with it for a purpose. And I need you to finish it. Don't stop middle way. Don't stop three quarter of the way. Don't misunderstand something that I've said or taught and and grumble, okay? But to be committed. See, God is committed to us and we expect him to be committed to us. When we call on him, we expect an answer. Well, guess what, guys? We first have to be committed to him. And then the windows are open. The covenant of Jesus Christ, a, a blood, the blood covenant, is something that Jesus holds very dear. They, their whole, um, their whole being was made with covenant. All right, and Jesus is a covenant man. So is God. There's many covenants in the Bible, and David said in Scripture, and I like this, that if I make my bed in hell, you'll find me there. Now, why do I like that so much? Because, you know, if I've done everything I can to follow Christ and I still end up on the downside of things, then God will find me there on the downside of things. And he will restore me. See, I'm not going to give up. I'm committed to you, Jesus. So, you know, like Peter said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Like, there is no other. So if I find myself in these situations, then obviously you're working something in me because I trust you. And I just need to just stay. Just stay with it until you deliver me. Because there's one thing I know, Jesus, that you will come. You will arrive. It may not be in my timing, but it'll be in yours. Okay? So if I stay committed... See, the thing is, the enemy don't want you to stay committed, and he's going to send all kinds of things to divert you into a new plan. So, but we've got to finish it. We've got to finish what he said. Remember, he said, it, who is my mother? Who is my father? Who, who is my family? Who's my kids? Who's my brother? Who's my sister? Who's my best friend? Who's my coworker? Who's my girlfriend? Who's my boyfriend? So who are they? They forsake me, God, and... But you won't. You won't. Okay? Now, I know I added a lot of family members in there. I, you know, he didn't necessarily say it like that. But I added some in there to get the point. The point is, who are my father? Who are my brethren? You know, only those that do the will of God. So, you know, he, all he was doing that day in the synagogue is separating those who the, do the will of God, who know him. So no doubt God is committed to us and we are expected to be committed to him. So fact is we need to be to committed to him. It's that simple. It's not for God to be committed. It's for us. I mean, God gets along fine without us. He wants us to be committed. He loves you. He wants you to follow him. There's no, there's no doubt in any of that. But the fact of the matter is that we don't do commitment for us, for uh, God. We do it for us. Amen? It adds to our lives. You know, it, it helps us to experience 
you know, an elevation with him, a greater understanding, a greater knowledge, an intimacy, a better knowing of who he is, then we can answer like Peter that was like, you know, I don't get you teaching, man, but whatever, I trust in you. Or, you know what, I don't understand why we're going this way, but I trust in you because, you know, I walked with you 20 years. You're not going to let me down now. Okay, so that's the the wheat and the tear sifting that takes place. And in Matthew 25, 23, Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servant. So in order to be good and faithful, we have to stay the course. We have to stay committed. We have to be faithful. You know, no matter what comes, like Job, you know, Job was an upright and righteous man and everything against him came. Oh my goodness, even his family deserted him and his wife said, curse God and die, Job. He, she's, he's like, woman, no, okay? God's got me. So no matter what everybody around you say, you have to stay with the one you know. Okay, who is that? Jesus Christ. He will never leave you. He won't forsake you. He never has in the past, and he's not going to start now. So we have to stay the course no matter what is going on in our lives, good or bad, right? It's seasons, all right? They change. That's what makes us who we are today, is that these seasons change. I never like to stay in summer all the time. I don't want to stay in winter all the time. I look forward to fall and I look forward to spring. I like variety. Variety is what um, teaches us. Variety helps us and pushes us, pushes us along, okay? I mean, without the winters, we don't appreciate the summers, right? If you're looking at seasons in that kind of way. So... You know, guys, I mean, we just have to stay faithful to to Jesus Christ. People get further in life sometimes, um, not because they are more talented, but because they're just simply more committed. That's the truth, man. I mean, especially in the church. You know, you don't have to have a lot of talent. You just have to have commitment. God will give you the talent. God knows how to do everything, and he can teach you how to do what you need to do. You know, when you're committed, your name will go before great men and women of God, and they'll call for you. Amen? But you have to stay committed. If you're just standing off in the crowd, and you're mumbling and grumbling, you know, guess what? You're just going to stay off in the crowd. But Jesus said, you've been faithful over a few things. Now come. Come and share from the Master. In other words, that promises to us that the windows of heaven are open now. And because I've been faithful, I've been committed, the windows of heaven are pouring in and blessing and rewards come from commitment. Amen. So if we would just only elevate our commitment level, we would reach the line we seem to never be able to cross over, right? to get the full blessing of God. So many times I hear people say, well, you know, I pray and it never comes, or it never works for me, or blah, blah, blah. I mean, come on, it does work. It does work. And guys, the problem is not with God. The problem is always with us. We just simply aren't getting it, okay? So we have to understand God's word in full. You know, the thing is that there's a misunderstanding to God's word, and guess what? We just put our own theories, our own thought processes, and we miss the whole plan of God, and we stay stuck. And I don't know about you. I don't like to be stuck. I'm not going to stay stuck, okay? And that's what happens, and nobody wants to stay stuck. So we need to elevate. We need to elevate our commitment level to Jesus Christ. And if we do that, then we'll cross over. Satan knows this. He knows it. He knows it more than, than Christians know it. Amen? He does. And Satan knows that if he can come after your commitment, he'll rob all of your blessings. That's all he has to focus on is your commitment. He can distract you to keep you from keeping your commitment. He can put you in a state of unbelief, uh, a misunderstanding to keep you from uh, your commitment, a place of distrust. 
will keep you from staying committed. Amen. He'll break you down little by little. He don't he don't come so obvious with him. He could just nudge you little by little by little until you have broken your commitment. Amen. And that's his whole thing. Because if he can get you frustrated and and when you're frustrated from not reaching your goals or reaching your commitment, then usually that person will develop some uh, s- some branches off of that root. Okay, so what comes with that is depression, the emotional things, uh, the sense of failure, um, just different things will start seeping into your mind. You know, distrust. You, you, you I'm not gonna trust anybody. Um, you know, just stupid stuff that the enemy places into your head. You know that that, uh, and I think about church hurt people. You know, and how they get church hurt over misunderstandings. And to me, that's just the craziest thing I've ever heard. You know, people need to resolve things. You know, the Bible says to go to a person and we need to go to people and get things resolved. I, you know, but people are so, um, non-confrontational and I don't understand it. They'd rather mumble in their own group or mumble in their own selves you know, their own thoughts or listen to what the enemy says and never go to the source, never actually work it out. You know, they're so non-confrontational, but boy, they're opinionated. All right. So that's the commitment level that the enemy um, tries to raise in us. And what we have to do is be committed to Jesus Christ, but know and trust him that he's never, ever let us down and he's not going to let us down now. Amen. I know this is good. Come on. Because if you hold tight, no matter what you're having to ride out, you will get to the other side. Amen. It may take a little time. It may not take much time. But it doesn't matter how much time it takes. You're going to get there. And as long as you start saying it, believe in it, then say again and putting a demand on it. Amen. Jesus told me one time, he said, June, if you would put a demand on it and quit thinking the wrong thing, then I will answer that prayer. I said, what do you mean to put a demand on it? And I felt in my own self that that was like, I can't say that to God. I can't say, God, I demand in, in the name of Jesus Christ that you do this. You know, but God was telling me that, you know, put a demand on it is is putting in another level of faith. And he showed me that. And today I still put a demand on expectations of what I need in Jesus Christ to further my ministry in him. Not put a demand on, I want a new car. I want this. I want a new job. I want blah, blah, blah. No, none of that. Okay. It's, it's putting a demand to follow Christ, to do the right thing, to be, um, used in your giftings and callings that God has given you. So Satan, back to him, knows our elevation in God is tied to our commitment. So it's easy. He comes after your commitment level. He, before you know it, you know, you procrastinate to the point that it never gets done. And then, then you just want to give up all, all together. You know, we blame Satan for a lot of this, guys, and really it's us. We need to time manage, and we need to be able to stay the, lo- the long haul, steady as she goes, you know, and space this stuff out in a time-managed way. You know, all of this is part of discipline. You know, we need discipline in our lives in order to, ch- to achieve goals and to stay faithful, Okay, I think it's like a spirit of faithfulness, you know, determined to stay, determined to hold no matter what comes your way. You know, Mike and I was out in the yard yesterday and Alpha Doe was here and it was, uh, she caught me by surprise and um, she was a long way away and she had the herd with her and I walked out and I came to a halt, quick halt. And she made eye contact with me, that ominous stare. If anybody knows anything about deer, it's, it's, it's just eerie, okay? So I'm in this ominous stare. I'm not moving. I whisper like this to Mike. And I say, don't move. 
And of course he knows, I just felt like I had to tell him, he knows more about it than I do. You know, he's hunted all of his life. And he didn't move. We didn't say anything. We waited her out. <laughs> we waited her out. We waited her out. And she had a young yearling, probably last, last summer's deer. And he was kind of picking around, but she was more elevated. She knew more. Okay. And she's alpha doe for a reason. So she's making me and Mike and she stares, which went on forever. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I knew that I couldn't walk off, move. Um, you know, the wind's in my favor. I knew we were okay. So it, we weren't in danger. It wasn't that. I just did not want her to be fearful, flag, drop scent, and I wouldn't see him back for three or four days, if longer, okay? And there's other reasons why I didn't want it to occur. But I stared, and I held. I just held it, okay? Sometimes, guys, we just have to hold it. Just hold on. You know, it's hard. It was hard. We stood there five minutes without hardly flinching. And what she did is she stepped off, looked down, and deer are so known to do this. And what, what she did is she looked down and she looked back up real quick. And she does that to see if she can catch you off guard. She's trying to outsmart you, okay? Still froze, it didn't move, Mike didn't move. And so she didn't catch us off guard, so she's starting to relax. I could tell by her body language. Okay, so she eased off down into the woods and all was well. See, that's the thing, guys. The enemy tries to catch us off guard and distract us to make the wrong move. And we have to focus in on our commitment to Jesus Christ and know that no matter what we're going through, that when seasons come, that he's going to get you through it. You just have to hold on. Amen? We just have to hold on. See, guys, God transforms us little by little. You know, I mean, I don't know why. God's God. I'm not. But it's hardly ever escalated. You know, we're ne never usually on the fast track in, in, the, in our walk with Jesus Christ. You know, you have to stay committed like Jacob. You know, Jacob had to wrestle with an angel. He wrestled with himself, amen? And we like to label it on the devil when really it's our flesh that we have to wrestle with. We have to wrestle to pray, to take the time to pray. We have to wrestle to spend time with God. We have to wrestle to, to uh, you know, serve God, go to church, you know, get out of the bed and go to church instead of tuning in on Sunday morning in our pajamas, drinking our coffee and eating our biscuit or whatever we eat. Amen? Seriously. I mean, it, it does take a higher level of commitment, okay, and determination, and we just have to hold. Just hold it. Amen? And stay with it until, um, you know, Jesus gives us new orders. Amen? And when he gives us new orders, then we go forth. So it's important that we feed the spirit of man during this time so we can fight and put our flesh under subjection. In Corinthians 9.27, it says, I keep my body under control. Now that's in a different translation. Another translation that you're more familiar with says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. I bring it into subjection. So yeah, I mean, I'd rather, you know, do this or do that instead of, you know, do this or this for God. Okay. And then before you know it, guess what? You're out of time. See, commitment positions you for favor. Never forget that. Commitment positions you for favor. Every member wants committed churches. Amen. We expect it. Those those leaders leaders and those pastors, they're oh man, they better be committed if I'm going to attend it, right? Isn't that how we feel? 
Okay? Well, churches wants committed members. So we have to do our part too. Amen? Whether we're a member or whether we're a leader. Commitment makes you attractive. People see value in committed people. If you're not committed to me as a leader and as someone who trains leaders and has has uh, taught many, many years in Bible college and, and trained up uh, leaders and position and put pastors into place in other churches, you know, that I'm very, very proud of. They've done so well. I look for commitment, for commitment. Jesus is looking for commitment. They're very attractive when they're doing um, ongoing day after day after day. They're so committed to the cause of Christ. So let me say, if people don't value you, it doesn't mean that you have something wrong with your value. It's it's their eyes. It's their perception of things. Okay? So don't let anybody devalue you. Okay? If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're committed to Jesus Christ, stay. Hold it. Amen? Hold it. Don't move. And wait, because God will call you to the front doesn't matter. I'll never forget. I share this, and I know I'm getting off my notes, but I just feel impaled. I was in a church in Jefferson a long time ago. You know, it was a big church. There was a lot of people there. Uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds. And I sat on the back row, thought I could just sneak in, and it, it happens to me a lot when I visit places, and I don't know why I think this, but I sneak in and sit on the back row, don't want to be noticed, and that service, there was a prophetic preacher preaching. Out of all of those people, you know, a little short June, all right, 5'2", slumped down on the back row, looks through all of those people's heads and says, hey, young lady on the back row, you know, and I don't know why I do it. I should know better. I'm like, <laughs> like he, like it's somebody else. I knew it was me. I did. I just knew. He said, come to the front. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm telling you that aisle seemed so long. I didn't think I was ever going to get to the front. Now, this is early on in my ministry. I'm not too embarrassed in front of people anymore, but I was then, and I didn't want to be called out, okay? So here I am standing in front of this prophet, and I know he's got a word for me, Okay? And he, he gave me a word that I knew. Now hear this. I knew he heard from God because I knew who I am in Jesus Christ. I knew my call. I was committed. I have an intimate relationship with the Lord. And I knew exactly what God was calling me to do. All he was doing was confirming what I already knew. Amen? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the Bible says it should be established. See, we don't have to go to churches to get a word. We need to go to God to get a word. Now, I did not say that you don't need to go to church and hear preaching. That is not what I said, okay? We must assemble ourselves in the house of God, okay? I mean, more so in the end days, it says, okay? So let me get that clear. I'm saying don't follow a prophetic preacher just to get, a, a you know, a word for your life, amen? Because the words of life are written in the book, amen? The Bible, amen, amen, and amen, somebody. Okay, so I know I'm way off the page, so let me get back. In Galatians 6 and 9, it says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, guess what? We will reap if we faint not. That means hold on. Hold it, okay? Stay with it. Don't give up. You stay with Jesus Christ, okay? He's the only one you can trust. The only one when it comes down to, to that. Okay? You hold on to Jesus Christ. Amen. And don't lose heart, the Bible says. You know, why? Because, you know, they knew. They knew that the enemy was going to tempt us. They knew that. Okay? The scripture is dependent on you to not break. It is dependent on you to be committed, to be unbreakable, because you will reap if. Okay? 
A lot of people miss that little old word, if. You will reap if you don't give up. So here I am to remind us all of how important it is to stay committed. See, you've come too far, folks, to just give up now. Don't stop in, it, right at the midnight hour, amen? You've come too far. Please, you know, don't give up. Don't stop, you know, don't stop. So when the enemy wants you to stop, what he'll do is he'll just put, try to put your car in park, amen? That's what he'll do, you know, just sling it up in park, rip out a transmission, amen? But that is not what we need to do, amen? I mean, we need to hit the accelerator when, when we get derailed by, God, by Satan himself, and just hit the accelerator and just keep on moving. Amen. The enemy tries to break your will and tries to even break your faithfulness. And like I said, it's him trying to steal your commitment. He's messing with our lives. The devil, even though it's the primary thing with you, he's actually after your commitment. To get you to stop with all the things that you're committed to, okay? Your call, your work, your diet, your exercise program, your budget, your relationship, your marriage, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, um, your uh, work, uh, your job, your anything. He, he's after it all. Just stop you from being committed. Amen? And he doesn't want you to win in anything. So we have to determine our faithfulness, okay? Don't miss this. I'm almost done. Jesus is having a discussion with his 12, and he says something that's kind of hard to chew, it, chew up. Jesus is saying, I got too much going on to discover down the road you're not dependable and you can't walk with me. I love it. I love it. See, I will set forth what you need. Okay, Jesus was saying, I will set forth what you need to do to walk with me. I'm loyal because love is loyal. Okay, so there's nothing but loyalty in Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not playing here, so you need to get it. Okay, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And the text says many of them got offended, right? They they had infatuation. They didn't have love. Come on. They had a crush. They didn't have love. Love keeps you loyal. Love keeps you committed. Amen? And no matter, you know, like a marriage. So, you know, a marriage, especially, like I've been married a long time, and I've got a good marriage, but it isn't always great. There's times that it's up and down. Anybody been married for a long period of time would tell you that it's not 100% always great. See, but we stay committed. We're vowed to each other. Love keeps you committed. Okay, so, you know, I could be in a bad mood. Mike could be in a bad mood one day. And guess what? We might be a little snappy. That don't mean I'm going to pack my suitcase. Come on, somebody. But why does members do that in churches? I don't get it because they're not in love. They're not loyal. Why would we do that to Jesus Christ? Because he's not answering on our time frame? Because he's not answering when I want him to answer? Because I don't feel like that Jesus meets my expectation? Or maybe I'm not good enough when Jesus said that it's his righteousness that lives in me and causes me? Amen. It's not anything that I can do. I can do nothing without Jesus Christ. So once we realize that, we know who we are, and we realize how loyal he is to us, it's easy to be loyal to him because you love him. If we have a hard time being loyal, we need to look at our relationship with Jesus. Because once that love is perfected in him, the loyalty and commitment is perfected in him. Come on, that's good. I know it is. See, not getting so easily offended. That's what that's what we have to do. Is you know, we wouldn't get so easily offended with one another if we love them. Amen. I mean, truly love them the way Christ shows us how to love. So, this will help you in your personal relationships. You know, don't get offended over your interpretation of something. 
You know, don't walk out on a marriage or don't walk out on, you know, somebody you've been dating five years just over a situation. You know, get some clarity. Take a further step. What is wrong with people who are non-confrontational? I mean, I don't get it. You know, it's always their opinion, your opinion, and the devil's in the middle. Amen. That's what it is. So when you two come together, it gets worked out. See, the devil doesn't want you to come together because he doesn't want it worked out. I mean, I've been a pastor for a long time, and I'm going to tell you it's that way every time. Every time. You know, it's people are just misunderstanding. And we need to understand. We need to understand one another. We need to understand Jesus Christ. This day, those people that were on looking in the synagogue in Capernaum, guess what? They didn't understand. They thought that they were supposed to like nibble on Jesus' arm or something. It's because they didn't want with him. They had no clue. They had no clue. So Jesus said, no matter what, this is my standard. And this is what I'm calling you to. That's my standard. Okay? I'm not saying you need to be here right now. And I'm not saying that I'm going to allow you to be here. You're going to come up to here for this time. And Jesus will keep calling us to here. And keep calling us to here. You know? And if we keep lowering and lowering, you know, then Jesus will call us back. I thank God for grace. All right? But the enemy is pulling us down, or he'll try if we allow it. He'll keep, you know, trying to pull us down. Stay committed. Hold it. Hold it. Amen? Hold it. Don't allow the enemy to distract you. All right? Don't run off, you know, and be fearful or non-trusting. Amen? So, Peter pops up there, and he says, Nah, I ain't going nowhere. I ain't going nowhere. He said, Where else can I go, God? Where else? Because you have the words of eternal life. You speak things, God, and you do things for me that no one else can or ever has, and I trust you. You speak life. God, you transformed me. You know, and and Peter messed up a lot. And God always covered up his messes. And I believe that's because Peter loved God. And Peter walked with God. And there was a relationship and a knowing there. You know? So... You've done enough in the past to make me committed, Lord. I've been in this a long time, and you know, God, I I trust you. I may not understand you, and I may not understand your timing, but I trust you. And because of that, I'm going to just stay. I'm going to hold it, and I'm going to wait on you to send the answer. I'm going to wait on you to provide the final result in your timing because I trust you, God. I trust you. Even though times could get hard, and sometimes they do, even in the good times, I still trust you, God, because I know you got me. You got me. And I've seen enough through all of this that I trust you, and I'm going to keep serving you, and I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to procrastinate. I'm not going to deviate all right because i don't want to be average with you god i want to be great you're calling me to be great and i want to be that and through you jesus christ i can be that you don't quit because it's hard guys you know you don't detour off because it's hard or too much or this excuse and that excuse You endure the detour. Endure the detour. Okay? Endure it. Like Joseph. He took him, God took him to the palace. But guys, he had to stop by the pit and the prison before he got there. But what would happen 
if he didn't hold it, what would have happened? Well, if you ask me, I think he would have never made it to the palace. Amen? So, stay committed. The reward's coming. I promise, if you stay in Jesus Christ and you hold on to him, you'll get there. Okay? May not be your way. May not be your timing. But you'll get there, folks. You'll get there. Stay God strong. Stay God strong. And you will win. Amen? It's good to be with you today. I thank you for listening. And um, till next time, thank you very much. Bye. That was an awesome word, Pastor June. And we want to thank the Holy Spirit for guiding her in Jesus' name. We want to thank each and every one of you. And before we go, we want to invite you uh, that have children and uh, to join us at 12 o'clock. Miss Donna is bringing a fantastic kids' church service at 12 o'clock. There's puppets. There's all sorts of stuff. I don't want to give away too much, so I want to leave it. And just make sure you tune in let you, and get your kids watching at 12 o'clock. You'll see that, uh, ex, that next event. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to pray a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Have a blessed week.